Children of the Longhouse by Joseph Bruchek Chapter 4 The New Lodge After a quarry crossed the river and climbed up the opposite bank, he looked back down toward his home. It was nearly hidden among the big trees in the shadow of the great hill everyone called the Big Nose. It looked like the small longhouse of sticks and pieces of bark that he had once made. It was strange how big things grew small when one moved away from them, O'Quarry thought. Their longhouse was so large that it could easily hold every family in their entire village. Hundreds of people, even including those who lived in the four smaller longhouses around it. In the winter, when the smokes of the central fires in the big longhouse filled the air, you could not see from one end of it to the other. Yet from a distance... It looked like something made by a child, smaller than the small lodge he was now about to make for himself. His uncle Big Tree had explained it to him. When you have walked far away from something, you will see it as part of all that is around you. When it is close, it may seem bigger than anything else, but our Creator was wise and made it so that we could also see things from a distance. Okwari reached his hand down and lifted up the drinking cup, which now hung from his belt. He had not realized when Big Tree was making it that it was meant to be his, but he understood why his uncle had given him the cup. Okwari let the cup drop from his hand to hang back at his side from its braided deerskin string. He stood up and looked at the saplings he had already cut to make his lodge. The day would be a long one. However, if he was going to complete even the roughest of lodges for himself before Elder Brother, the sun, left the sky, then he would have to keep working. He picked up the small axe again to cut one more pole from the stand of young maples. He had spoken to the largest of the maple trees, which arced over the many saplings, explaining his need to make a lodge. My friends, O'Quarry had said, you and your elders give us many gifts. You have just given us that sweet sap, which is our favorite drink. You know that we have thanked you for that with our ceremony of thanksgiving. You know that we always treat you with respect, for you are the chief of the trees. Now I ask you for something else. There are so many of your young ones here that they do not have room to grow. I am going to cut just a few to make my lodge poles. I will do so in a way that gives the other young trees more light and more room. Then he had begun to cut out the trees, cutting them very close to the ground so that no stubs would stick up to trip anyone walking here. It had not been hard to do with the small axe, for it was a very fine one. His younger uncle, Hand Talker, had made it, and everyone knew how good a craftsman he was even better than his older brother Big Tree. Perhaps Handtalker was the best maker of tools in the village of the bears. Okwari hefted the axe again in his hand, feeling how good its balance was. The blade was a solid piece of stone, the shape of a hand with the fingers held close together. It was fitted tightly into the handle, which had been split to hold it, and then bound above and below the stone. The stone had been pressure flaked so that it was sharp enough to cut wood, though nowhere near as sharp as the smaller flint blades that were made into knives keen enough to skin an animal. On the handle was the carved-in shape of a hand held open, palm out, Hand Talker's personal sign, that he put on everything he made. Okwari grasped the handle tightly with one hand and bent over the small trunk of the sapling with the other hand so that the blade would not bounce off the sapling as he struck. Circling the trunk with a handful of careful strokes, he cut the little tree. When he had finished trimming the small branches from the sapling, he added them to the brush pile that he had made near the tangle of blackberry stalks. Such a brush pile would be useful as shelter for smaller animals such as the rabbit. Okwari smiled as he added the branches, thinking of one of the brush piles on the other side of their village across the river. The pile was not far from the hilltop where he had dug out his cave under the slanting stone. 
Only two days ago, as he walked up to his cave, he had seen a rabbit go into that brush pile. Moving as slowly as a stalking bobcat, he had crawled over to the pile. It took him so long that Elder Brother the Sun moved the width of two hands across the sky. But it had been worth it. When he looked into the hole in the brush pile, he saw a little nest in the earth that was lined with rabbit fur. In that nest were five baby rabbits. They looked so soft that Okwari wanted to reach in and pick them up and hold them to his cheek. But he did not touch them. He only watched for a while, breathing slowly and smiling as they moved about in their nest. Then, as quietly and slowly as he had crept close, he had backed away. Perhaps, Okwari said, speaking both to himself and to the small maple trees which had sacrificed themselves to help him. This brush pile will be the home for another family of rabbits like the ones I saw. Truly, my friends, you have given more than one gift by allowing me to cut you. Okwari stood back to take a careful look. He had used a small pole the length of a spear, but twice as thick, to make the holes in which he would thrust the base of each of the saplings that would make the framework of his lodge. Early that morning, back in the longhouse, he had sharpened the pole with the flint knife he carried in the sheath that hung about his neck. Then he had hardened the sharp pole by holding it in the hearth fire until it was blackened. The holes he had pierced made a circle. There were thirteen of them, for this lodge was not going to be flat-sided and elongated, like the longhouses built to hold many families. Instead, this would be a personal lodge, much like the ones used by the Anantaks. Okwari squatted down on his haunches and leaned against the pole, which he still held. He let his eyes sweep out over the river below, the Tayuga Gahunda. He could see one canoe crossing there below him near the place where he had crossed in his own small elmbark canoe. He saw this, but he also saw in his mind another wider water in many canoes. He saw the story Big Tree had told him of how the people of the Longhouse gained their freedom from the Anantak people, who treated them like slaves. Okwari shook his head. The small canoe he had seen crossing was now out of sight. An elder brother, the sun, had moved still farther up into the sky. He would have to hurry if he hoped to finish his lodge. He moved aside the pile of elm bark shingles. He had carried them across the river in his canoe, taking three trips to do so. They were pieces which had been given him by some of the men who had been peeling elm bark to, repeal the big, to repair the big lodge. Okwari, they had called out to him. Come over here. Do you want these little pieces of elm bark? They are too small for us to use. You might as well have them. Then they had given him more than enough to cover the small lodge he planned to make, even some pieces that would have been large enough for them to use in their repairs. Okwari could tell the older men were pleased and amused by his seriousness. He wondered whether they had only decided to gather elm bark for repairs after hearing about his plan to make a lodge of his own. Okwari took one of the maple poles and began to thrust it into one of the holes. As he did so, he heard from behind him the sharp crack of a stick breaking, as if someone had stepped on it. He whirled around to see who had crept up on him. A tall, happy-faced man stood there. The dry stick that he had just snapped was held in his hand. It was Okwari's younger uncle, Hand Talker. Hantalker dropped the stick and held out his hand to tap the pole that Okwari had been placing into the ground. He made a motion, as if lifting the pole up. Okwari pulled the pole out of the ground. Hantalker made another motion, as if drawing something toward himself. Okwari understood. He handed the long lodge pole to his uncle. Hantalker smiled at him and then thrust the pole under the stub of his left arm. He had lost that arm in the same fall which hurt his throat so badly that his voice had been broken. He rested the slender tip of the pole on the ground and pulled his knife out of the, his sheath belt. 
Then, with careful strokes away from himself, he began to peel the bark from the part of the pole that would go into the ground. Okwari breathed in quickly. He felt angry at himself for being so foolish as to forget that an unpeeled pole set into the ground will rot quickly. Then he shook his head and smiled as his younger uncle had smiled. Handtalker had not intended to make him feel foolish. Handtalker had only wanted to help, and he had done so in the friendly way that made everyone admire him. Okwari picked up a pole himself, took out his own knife, and began to peel away the bark as his uncle was doing. The bark was loose, for the trees were still wet with the sap of spring, and he had only to make a few cuts down the pole to start freeing the bark. After that he could pull it free with his fingers. Even with only one hand his uncle was faster than he was. In the time it took Okwari to peel three poles, his uncle had done all the others. It was surely true, Okwari thought, as my mother told me. When a man or a woman has something taken from them, the Creator gives them something in return. It had only been after his accident, falling from the cliffs, where he had climbed to look into a nest of young eagles, that Handtalker had turned into the finest toolmaker in their village. He was able to do just about anything anyone else could, except use a bow and arrow. He could even paddle a canoe with one arm. It was Handtalker's canoe that Okwari had seen crossing the river below him. And even without a speaking voice, Handtalker was always able to make people understand him well with the gestures of his one hand. Once again, Okwari began to put the poles into the earth, moving around in a circle as he did so, until all of the poles were firmly set. Handtalker leaned against a tree as his nephew worked, nodding now and then in approval. It was not until Okwari began to bend two poles together, one from each side of the circle, so that he could tie their overlapping ends to make the first part of the roof arch, that he looked over to his uncle for help. Okwari said nothing. He did not need to speak. Handtalker understood immediately, came close, and reached out his hand to hold the ends of the bent poles together while his nephew lashed them firmly. Okwari used the thin strips of inner bark he had peeled from a basswood tree and then softened by running them back and forth over a smooth rock. Such basswood strings were almost as supple as deer skin and much stronger. As Okwari bent and tied other pairs of poles, he thought of how little he said aloud as his uncle Handtalker was alone with him. It was as if they could communicate better without words as if they could hear more clearly what was in each other's minds. Okwari found himself remembering something his own grandmother, walks quietly, once said to him. He had been playing the spear and hoop game with a group of children of his age. He was so excited that he was running and shouting as he played. Throw it now, he had said. Hit it before it stops rolling. Suddenly, he had run right into his grandmother. But even though he was big for his age and walks quietly was only a little taller than he was, he bounced off her as if he had run into a tree. She had seen him coming toward her and braced herself by bending her knees and putting one foot back behind her. Oh, Quarry, she had said then, drawing his name out in a teasing way as it, he peered up to her with a dazed look on his face. Do you know why the Creator made us with two eyes and only one mouth? No, Grandmother, Okwari had answered. It is because we always need to look twice as much as we talk. Then we will be less likely to run into things. Okwari tied the last of the poles. Carefully crisscrossed together at the top, they now made a shape like the shell of a turtle. Then, again with his uncle Handtalker's help, Okwari tied on the thinner saplings that went around the lodge, holding it more firmly together to make rings on which he could fasten the elm bark shingles. He left open the doorway, remembering how he had tried to make such a lodge two winters before, and then realized that he had not left an opening for a door. This doorway faced downriver, the direction of the sunrise. When they had tied the last of the sapling rings in place, Handtalker raised his hand, 
turned and went back down the path to the river. He knew that his nephew would be able to do the rest of the work on the lodge building without his help. Okwari touched his own hand to his heart and swung it out toward his uncle. Even though his back was turned, he was certain that Hand Talker knew he was saying thank you, giving his heart in gratitude to his uncle for the guidance he had been given. Hand Talker could never become one of the good men, the Loiane, even if his older brother should die, or through misdeeds have the horns of his office taken from him by his clan mother. Okwari's younger uncle could never assume the name and the position of Shoksawarwane, the big tree. A good man had to speak with great eloquence at the councils, and Hand Talker's silent tongue prevented him from being able to do that. Yet as Okwari watched his uncle disappear down the slope, he knew that Hand Talker was happy, being who he was and no one else. In his own way, Hand Talker, too, was one who always spoke for peace.